Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Touchdown Wire Divisional Round Playoff Matchup Podcast Preview Podcast Preview Playoff Matchup Podcast Preview. Uh, I am Doug Farrar, editor of Touchdown Wire on the USA Today Sports Media Network, and uh, as always, our five tool guy, Mark Schofield. Mark, we've done a lot. We've done, I counted up, 22, all 22 pieces in the last 10 days. That's a Synchronicity lot. right there. That's right. The police would be proud. The police would be proud. Okay, so... With all that said, we've got some in, extremely intriguing matchups here. Um, four games that are entirely fascinating. Most people say that the divisional round is the best week of the NFL season, and certainly uh, this could be uh, could be the case. I want to start just before we get into the games. Urban Meyer in the NFL. Your thoughts? I, <laughs> I go two different ways on this. There's the, is this going to be like Saban when Saban got to Miami and didn't have five, five star recruits at every position and just realized now this just isn't for me. Um, or is it going to be more like urban Myers realizing that, look, I've worked my way up from Bowling Green to Utah to Ohio state. I've played with like lower caliber athletes before I can rebuild something I know a lot of people are worried about the health concerns, but it's, it's a different gig. Like you don't have to go on the road recruiting. You don't have to be traveling all off season to go to living rooms and stuff. So I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I'm very curious as to the offensive coordinator hire in that decision. Yeah. Um, I, I, you've, you've seen a lot of names linked to him, like Adazio from Boston college. He's more a defensive minded guy, but a lot of, former head coaches at the FCS, FBS level um, that he's going to try to loop in to be, you know, sort of, uh, you know, not right-hand, left-hand men, but something in that vein. Um, So I think the coordinator hires are going to be huge, but this is such an attractive job. Um, And I'm not surprised in a sense that the the Khan family sort of went big, went splashy here because you've got a chance to really remake that franchise in one season. Six picks, six picks in the top hundred. The keys to the Trevor Lawrence kingdom, and I've been watching him over the past couple of days just because I'm trying to get a start on draft stuff. He's I mean, so maybe good. he's not like luck. He's maybe so he's good. not that, but I mean, just just some of the throws he made. I, I watched the the game against Notre Dame, and it's just this is ridiculous. And some of the the athleticism too. Yeah. And so you can turn that team around in a season. So yeah, go big with the hire. So I'm cautiously optimistic. What about you? I have serious concerns. Really? Um, I think when you go from college to the NFL, the one word I think of when it comes to success is accountability. And I remember talking to Pete Carroll halfway through his first season in Seattle. And I said in, in a nicer way than this, why should we believe that you are any different than the guy who tanked with the Jets and the Patriots in the 90s? And he's talked about the year between – the Patriots and USC, where he he did some stuff for NFL.com, wrote some articles, and and kind of he started reading a bunch of John Wooden books and got his head together and said, I real I self scouted and I realized all the stuff I did wrong. Yeah, I don't know Urban Meyer. I'm not in his living room having coffee with him in the morning, saying, Hey, Urban, what do you think about blah blah blah? But I don't. I mean, you go back to Florida, especially. Yeah, there's a lot of shit there, and. Yeah. I'm not saying he's going to be Bobby Petrino, but I, I, somebody I respect this morning on Twitter said this could be like a Jimmy Johnson hire. And I like my eyes bugged out of my head. I, I've, I've talked to Jimmy Johnson about when he took over in Dallas and two things. He had the supreme advantage as Pete Carroll did early in his time in Seattle. All the guys he recruited in high school were coming out of college. So it was like, bink, 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 bink. I mean, Pete recruited Richard Sherman out of high school. So yeah. that's why you know, the, the former receiver out of Stanford who, you know, was like body fat of minus 0.3. He's like, nobody thought he was going to be who he was. And Pete kind of had a suspicion. Jimmy Johnson put that team together. Don't let anyone, no one else in that building had the scouting together the way Jimmy did. So what Jimmy built, Jimmy built. I mean, yeah. and then, you know, Jerry, I, you know, wanted to be credited as the guy. Well, the reason he wanted to be credited as the guy is that Jimmy did it. Yeah. So the accountability, the team building, um, 
and no, you're not recruiting. No, you're not doing all the, you know, the garbage you have to do with the NCAA, but you're also dealing with guys who are 30 years old and making more than you are. Yeah. And they've heard it all. And they don't really give a flying F who you are. If, if you can help them win, great. If not, you could be Newt Rockney and Vince Lombardi coming back, you know, from the grave and Frankensteining together. And these guys aren't going to care. Um, I get that it's a splashy hire and maybe he's learned some stuff because you have to go pretty deep because a lot of bodies were, you know, buried at Florida, but it was not a good situation. And yeah, no, I mean, that's you got, you, you deal, the Jaguars are dealing with, I, we're going to talk about Devonte Adams and Jalen Ramsey and they faced off once before. And it was Ramsey's first game is in the NFL with the Jaguars in 2016. And I was watching the Jacksonville defense and how amazing it was in 2016 and then 2017 when they almost went to the Super Bowl. And then they bring in Tom Coffin and Tom, as he does, tells everyone to get off his lawn. And they let a guy in, splashy hire. He ruined the whole thing. They're just getting over that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I hope it works out for everybody involved. I, I know some people high up in the Jaguars organization. I, I, I think they're good people. I think they're trying to get it right. I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the accountability portion is a very good point. Um, you know, what he's learned in his time away from the game, you know, if anything might be. I, I mean, you, there, there's stuff you can get away with as a college head coach. You can never get away with in the NFL or in yeah. any other part of public life, except for perhaps, perhaps government. And I, I wonder if in some sense, you know, cause it, it, if he's the splash hire, You'd have to imagine that other teams came calling. Well, the Chargers yeah. were the Chargers were hot on him. Yeah, but maybe from his perspective, he's thinking, "Look, I can go to a smaller media market. That's more comfortable to me. Like if I go to the Jets, I've got the New York City media department. Oh, yeah, that's never going to work for me. I mean, I wonder if that's why of all the jobs that Urban Meyer has been linked to over the years since he left coaching, this is the one that he was like, "I'm going to do." Because it's Jacksonville, it's a smaller media market. Like, yeah, there's also the whole thing of you know head coach GM. I, I I watched Mike Holmgren struggle with it for years in Seattle. Then he went to the Browns and he took Brandon Whedon in the first round. You know, yeah, one of the most brilliant head coaches of all time, schematic whatever. Um, it, it's it's just a different gig, right? And 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 you're look if you if you get to be a head coach at the Ohio States of the world or the in the NFL you have a belief in yourself that you can fix anything. You can coach anybody, anybody up that when that bleeds into the evaluation process, you're going to have trouble. You know, and I see that with Bill Belichick all the time, believe mm -hmm. me, you know, yeah. greatest, greatest head coach of all time, but he thinks that he could take, you know, Vanderbilt's third string strong safety and turn him into a starter in the NFL. Well, sometimes he can. Yeah. That, the difference with Bill is sometimes he can. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd bank on that more than anything, but yeah, we'll see. I mean, Bill had his time in Cleveland. It didn't work out either, although it wasn't really his fault. They were on the verge, but yeah, yep. I just, I thought it was an interesting news nugget. All right. Matchups. Let's start with Rams at Packers. Jalen Ramsey. This is per NFL research. Crazy numbers against the league's top receiver this season. Amari Cooper, Seven receptions, 57 yards, no touchdowns. Stephon Diggs, one reception, four yards, one touchdown. Terry McLaurin, no receptions. Allen Robinson, one catch, 42 yards. Let's put a pin in that one. DK Metcalf, no receptions, week 10. Mike Evans, uh, four receptions, 40 yards, week 11. DeAndre Hopkins, three receptions, 20 yards, no touchdowns, which is what happens when you put him at backside ISO and you don't move him around. <sighs> Come on, Cliff. Uh, DK Metcalf week 16, one reception, 11 yards, zero touchdowns. And as, I, as I've pointed out multiple times, there was meat on the bone for Metcalf yeah. against Ramsey. If Wilson had just, and Russell Wilson did not play well second half of the season. Nope. Um, so that's a different, you know, that's a different thing. DeAndre Hopkins week 17, two catches, 28 yards, no touchdowns. Again, backside ISO stopped doing that. DK Metcalf in the playoffs, three receptions, 33 yards, no touchdowns. None of these receivers had a hundred yards for the full game. So now he goes against Devontae Adams, who I believe is a singular, and I wrote at length about this this week, I touched on where, singularly, specifically, spectacularly horrible matchup for Ramsey for all kinds of reasons. Outside of Stephon Diggs, who he gave up a touchdown to on a, a, a quick in cut in the end zone, I can't think of a worse matchup for Ramsey. And it's, 
I remember watching, I think it was 2013 Seahawks Chargers and Keenan Allen lit Richard Sherman up because Keenan Allen is such a peerless route runner and understands like what the inflection points of the routes are. Yeah. And he'll, he'll know exactly when to move and he'll like watch a guy's feet and go, okay, this is, this is where I cut. And really Sherman had no answer for it. Richard Sherman's one of the greatest cornerback could be the greatest cornerback of his era, either him or Revis at this point, but like most bigger, taller, lankier, longer limbed, defensive backs he struggled struggles with guys who can set the tone with accurate and kind of twitchy cuts faster twitch yeah. guys yeah those change of direction types so let's start with the routes let's go back to alan robinson's 42 yard catch and i went back and watched it came on a route where he faked ramsey inside from the backside i saw then went back outside for the fade ramsey couldn't keep up matt Calf had all, all kinds of opportunities negated by russell wilson's inaccurate throws as i mentioned so sports info solutions uh, of the 342 yards Ramsey has allowed this season, 101 have come on curls and comebacks quick changing routes that force Ramsey to adjust more quickly than he might be able to on out routes and dig routes. Adams is one of the most prolific receivers. He has a league leading 28 catches on a league leading 36 targets, 259 yards, 194 yards after the catch and three touchdowns. Um, and as you know, because you did a thing on dig for inside the pylon, which I referred to in my article, uh, out and dig routes are complementary opposites. On an out, the receiver runs what looks like a straight vertical route, then he cuts sharply outside. On a dig, receiver runs the vert and then cuts sharply inside. And as I wrote in my notes, my touchdown where colleague Mark Schofield had a great breakdown of the dig route on inside the pylon. We'll put that in the in the rundown. Against outs and digs this season, again, quick breaking routes that force intermediate responses. Ramsey has allowed 14 receptions on 19 targets for 58 yards and two of his three touchdowns. And again, as we've seen, you know, Russell Wilson, blah, blah, blah. Adams also has, and I was listening to the Chris Collins podcast with Richard Sherman, which if you don't listen to that, it's so good because Sherm is so smart and goes into the intricacies of the position. And they had Devontae Adams on two weeks ago. And that was like a Sherman Adams talking was like a master class in everything. I mean, you could get a year's worth of content out of that 20 minutes. It was just incredible. Adams had a great, I, I've never heard any receiver describe it this way, although I've seen other guys do it. Jefferson is great as, for, for a rookie. Stefan Diggs is great at Keenan Allen, I would also say. Adams has a great ability to turn one route into another without giving anything away. And he explained it on the podcast. He said, here's a little secret some people don't know about me, just so you know my mentality about route running and how I attack everything. I don't want people anywhere near me when I catch the ball. So let's say I have a 15 yard stop route or a comeback or something. Well, okay. What's Ramsey you know, vulnerable against if Richard Sherman was to undercut that thing and a rod Aaron Rodgers is not throwing it. What I do is loop straight up the field every time, almost in the same motion to make you feel every time that this was the route. I know you covered it well, but I don't want you to know that you covered it well. Well, what's the other thing Ramsey struggles with is double moves up the vert. Yeah. Your thoughts? Because I I don't I think if I'm Brandon Staley, I'm putting <clears throat> Darius Williams, who is the quicker twitch corner on Adams with John Johnson up top. Because you, you if you don't put safety help to Adams' side, you're gonna go home. Yeah, and you know we we've mentioned two names earlier on the show: Bill Belichick and Darrell Revis. And this game screams to me one of those Belichick game plans where he looks Darrell Revis in the eye or looks Stephon Gilmore in the eye and says, look, you're our number one coverage corner. Your job in this game is MVS. You're going to go cover their number two. Match I'm going to leave you in an island on an island with that guy. And we're going to take our number two corner, maybe it's Williams, and we'll dedicate safety help to that side of the field. Um but this idea that, you know, we all get excited. We're going to get a great matchup, whether it's Ramsey versus DK Metcalf or Ramsey versus Adams. But, you know, if I'm Brandon Staley, that's the approach I'm taking. Because I'm Ramsey's taking smarter than both of us combined. When it comes absolutely. To football. Absolutely. I mean, he's going to know this stuff. He's going to yeah. all that stuff I researched for half a day. He already knows it. Right. And, and you got into some of the coverage numbers, you know, versus two high looks versus single high looks and just how deadly Adams has been against single high look. So, I mean, you're not going to leave. Here's, here's one way to take, and I, I, you know, it's really, fa it's one of the more remarkable stats I've seen this season. If you want to take Devontae Adams out of a game, run too high. This season yeah. against two safety coverage, which is cover two, two man, cover four, cover six, Tampa two. 
Adams has 18 catches on 27 targets for 223 yards, 51 yards after the catch, and one touchdown. Against single high, we'll cover one, cover three, we'll say combo for the hell of it. He has 72 catches on 95 targets for 970 yards, 50, 576 yards after the catch, and 14 touchdowns. He has one touchdown against two high. He has 14 against uh, one high. I assume the rest are cover zero, and if you're playing cover zero against the Packers, I don't know what the hell. Uh, yeah. But if you want to take him out of the game, then MVS and Tanyan is a guy they like to run stuff because on, on too high. The Rams have played some sort of variant of two deep on 208 pass defense snaps, allowing 128 completions for 1,475 yards, three touchdowns, three interceptions, four more dropped interceptions. That tells you all you need to know about a bend but don't break defense that really breaks. Yeah, I mean, I wondered if strategy. I wondered if Brandon Staley is going to come out and run more two man and just you know have two safeties over the top, make sure somebody's over the top wherever Adams goes. But it's not Ramsey on Adams; it's Ramsey on MVS. And you might take away a lot of stuff that they do. They they could make Ramsey the star and put him on Tanya and just beat people up the line of scrimmage because Ramsey can certainly do that. Yeah, I mean, you've seen him cover tight ends before. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I think if 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 you're going into this game as a fan expecting to see a ton of, you know, Ramsey on Adams, I think you're going to be disappointed. Now, again, well, I, I think if you, if, you, if you see a bunch of Ramsey on Adams, I think who's going to be disappointed is the Rams. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the better way to put it. Um, you know, and, and all of this is happening behind Aaron Donald, remember? Oh, yeah. Um, him. We got to remember him, too. And um, Leonard Floyd, by the way, who... who yeah. Whoa. Yeah, you mentioned him, I think, in last week's show or two weeks ago, and then I got a chance to watch some of the Rams over the past week, and I was just like, yeah, he's playing extremely well. Um, he's playing he himself now become. He has now become – Well, and you talk about great defensive coordinators. Like, who who steps up? Because who the hell knew who Darius Williams was before Brandon Staley arrived? And he's been right. there for years. He brings Leonard Floyd over from Chicago where he was the outside linebackers coach, and all of a sudden Leonard Floyd is – Leonard Floyd is good against a run? What? And then yeah. now he's this complimentary pass rusher who I've said for the last, you know, two months, Leonard Floyd is going to make $40 million. Don't be surprised in the new league. Yeah. So yeah, the front is one thing. Um, Bakhtiari is out with the ACL. They signed Jared Velier, and I believe Velier is now out with a COVID thing. Yeah. And I went into how evil Staley's front multiplicity is. And, it, you know, it's not just lining up because kind of Wade Phillips did this. Um, it was, you know, four on the floor, nickel. You just kind of run your guys. And, and Wade would do some stuff. But Staley with the with the stunts and the who's up and who's down. And at full strength, the Packers offensive line did not handle protection rules particularly well against things they were not anticipating. And so that could be a real problem, too. Well, it's that Tampa Bay game when yep. Tampa Bay, you know, pulled out top bowls, pulled out some sub packages. Also the Carolina game. Looks. Also right, the, the Carolina, Carolina game. The Carolina too. game was even worse for their protections. The, Aaron Rodgers was sacked five times against five different kinds of fronts. Again, Staley already knows this before we do. Right. No, but I mean, look, the, the Rams certainly have a chance to hand in this game. The question is, how much are they going to get on offense? Well, because this is a Packers yeah. defense that we've been talking about the past couple of weeks, which is, which is getting better. Um, Darnell Savage, baby. Yeah. Um, whether it's Jared Goff, John Wolford, um, you know, this Rams offense might struggle. Forecast for this game, 33 degrees, low of 25, no snow. Goff has not played in cold weather much, but his worst game ever came against the Bears in week 14 of the 2018 season. He threw no, t- no touchdowns with four picks, and I believe it was 29 degrees at game time. Could have thrown three more. Everything about Goff that made you worry was on display. That game was Sean McVay's official introduction to the Bears outside linebackers coach who made his life specifically miserable, Brandon Staley. McVay has said that was that game was the reason that he hired Staley to replace Wade Phillips because, yeah. okay, you kicked my ass, I want to hire you, which is a very right. smart way to do it. Um, the Packers outside linebackers coach is Mike Smith, not that Mike Smith, who has overseen Green Bay's pass rush over the last two seasons and helped D Ford and Chris Jones develop before that on the Chiefs staff. So Mike Smith will probably be joining the Rams staff after the season if this goes well for the Packers, which it probably will. I'm just saying. Yeah. So uh, you have in the notes here that you'd go with John Wolford. 
I would go with Walford only because he brings more to the run game. And Cam Akers, if, if, you and I both watched Cam Akers um, when we were putting our draft stuff together. And my thought, my only thought on Cam Akers, if he can be productive against that offensive line, I say against, I mean, his, his own offensive line was like his opponent. It was right. one of the worst offensive lines I've ever seen. And I live in Seattle. There you go. Um, so Akers is, you know, I think they'll run a lot of 12 and 13, which would benefit Goff because Goff, he is what he is, yeah. um, has worked better at a 12 and 13, but yeah, I would go with Walford because, um, I mean, you're, you're not going to outscore Aaron Rodgers. You're not going to outplace Aaron Rodgers as a quarterback. If you put Goff and Walford together, they're not half as good as Aaron Rodgers. Um, right. I think this this is a real sort of matriculation point for Goff in his career. Um, you know, we, we talked about Wentz all year, uh, you know, uh, and Wentz fell through a canyon. I don't think Goff is that much better, even when he's healthy. But, you know, that's no, just me. He's not. Um, you're a quarterback guy. I mean, how, how do you run it? I mean, I, I think you're right. Walford does give you more in the run game. I think what you saw early against Seattle, you saw some of that. They were calling some designed runs as a result. Um, he gives you one more thing to think about. The more I'm watching quarterbacks now, the more I'm watching the two guys we're going to talk about next, that ability to play 11 on 11 now as an offense against defenses in the run game is huge. Um, so I think it just gives you that extra element. And especially if, you know, you mentioned the word matriculation. You know, like this might be a matriculate the ball down the field kind of afternoon for the Rams. Like, you don't want to give Aaron Rodgers short field. They don't really have any other field. choice. They don't have yeah. any other choice. They don't so, have they don't have that quarterback on their right. Roster. So, I, I think yeah, John Wolfer is the guy I'd go with. We know that's where McVay's head is at anyway. That's what he was going to do last week. The only reason that Goff ended up playing was because Wolfer got hurt. Well, you go back to last year when McVay tried to bring Blake Bortles in on those run packages I mentioned yeah. last week and they were horrifically bad, but McVeigh has wanted to have that in his quiver. He has yeah. wanted, I don't want to say he wants his own Taysom Hill, but there's an element of that sort of switcheroo running quarterback thing that he finds appealing. Yeah. And since they run a, a bunch of heavy personnel could work. Yeah. And if, you know, um, I don't know how much quarters the Packers play. They're, they're primarily dime. Here's the other thing. Mike Pettin plays more dime than any other team or any other defensive coordinator. Um, heavy nickel, really heavy dime, like 50% dime. So if you can just make this a bash game, um, and we're going to talk about this with a couple other teams. The whole idea of keeping the other quarterback off the field, I mean, if the other quarterback it's, is Mahomes or Josh Allen or Aaron Rodgers, whatever yeah those so you, you, you still got to score touchdowns you got to yeah. score touchdowns yeah you can go three yards in a cloud or whatever but you got to score touchdowns yeah um so yeah that's any more thoughts on that game no nah, i think we got that one covered i mean i feel like we haven't talked enough about green bay's defense but i think the best green bay defense is kind of Jared Goff or John. Yeah. <laughs> or just I mean, letting I, them make I, mistakes. I, yeah. I, I, I rolled heavy. Uh, both of my matchup pieces were Green Bay's offense against the Rams defense because that's just where the fascination is. And I think yeah. it is the number one scoring offense versus the number one scoring defense. And none of that is a fluke. And Staley, um, I will say, I, you know, the the Panthers, they Green Bay won that game because, you know, Panthers. But – they made Aaron Rodgers' life miserable, and I found something. It, Rodgers was talking about the defense Phil Snow put together, and Phil Snow came over um, from Baylor with Matt Rule, first-year NFL defensive coordinator, and Rodgers was talking about how the defense looks strange. Think about that. Yeah. First-year DC messing with Aaron Rodgers' head because he's bringing in collegiate concepts that Rodgers has not seen simply because there aren't a lot of those defensively. Well, Staley isn't that far removed from college either. And so I think Aaron Rodgers could see more strange stuff. And I'll say again, NFL teams, if you want to think outside the box, get a really good college defensive coordinator on your staff, because then you can make Aaron Rodgers say, that defense was strange. Yep. Yeah. Ravens at Bills per CBS Sports. Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson have combined for 88 touchdowns and no interceptions in the red zone in their careers. That's just nuts. Yeah. What the hell? 
I mean, it's that run threat. It's that run <laughs> element that you have to account for as a defense, and it makes life easier for you as an offensive coordinator. I mean, you saw against the Colts what they were able to do with Josh Allen with that late throw, which is a designed play. Um, both of these guys have that ability to make you account for them in the run game, which leaves you with a numbers disadvantage perhaps in the passing game. And this is a numbers game and a numbers league, and they're going to exploit that. I think the Colts played the Bills about as well as they could, given where Rivers is. And yeah. after what I saw, I, I think, Phil, you had a nice run. Let's go be the next Tony Romo. Um, yeah. Could not throw to his left at all. But they, you know, ran the ball, stayed patient on defense, too high whatever zone, which, you know, I would say zone is Allen's kryptonite, but it's he would prefer man. And he's going to see a lot of it in this game, I would imagine, although Wink could, you know, throw a switch in that. Um, the, the, and there, the, were, the, there, the, were, there were elements of that game where Josh Allen looked a little bit like the Josh Allen we saw in last year's playoffs. Not there were a couple of flashes. Yeah. There were a couple of flashes where it was like, okay, Josh, calm down. The, that the sack fumble late. Like, yeah. you know, a that, lot of people had was, a flashback. That was straight out of that game last year. Yeah, like, that was oh. – a lot of people had flashbacks to that Texans game. I mean, look, Everflux stayed in too high because the Bills don't have a run game right now, really, to speak of. I mean, their run game is for the rest of the postseason. Which yeah, sucks. their run game is Josh Allen, and that's why Dable was calling designed runs with Josh Allen because that was the only real run game they had to try to get them out of cover too high. Um, this is a Wink has a decision to make here. I, I think if you stay in man coverage, Josh Allen twenty five touchdowns, two interceptions against man coverage this year. I said, if you want to stay, yeah, I mean, is it? I think so. My producers telling us it's good. Yeah. Um, if you want to stay in man coverage and think back to what happened against Kansas city earlier in the year, they went state in man coverage. They tried to be blitz heavy. That didn't work. They tried to do some zone stuff that didn't work. They couldn't figure it out in time. He has that same decision to make. If you want to stay in man coverage against Josh Allen, he's going to run against you and he's going to throw against you. They can't run the football right now, unless it's Josh Allen state, try to do more zone stuff, too high looks, dare them to run the ball without Josh Allen, keep eyes on him. I think that's what they have to do this week. So this is uh, from Matt Perino, who works for News 4 Buffalo, WIVB-TV, and I think for Syracuse.com. Um, really nice information from Matt. Thank you, sir. No team was blitzed more in 2020 than Buffalo Bills. No team's defense blitzed more in 2020 than the Baltimore Ravens. Josh Allen stats this season, uh, pressure, no pressure, and blitz, not blitz, courtesy of PFF. Not blitzed. Uh, well, no pressure, 26 touchdowns, four interceptions. Under pressure, 13 touchdowns, six interceptions. Not blitzed, 21 and eight. When blitzed, <laughs> 18 touchdowns and two interceptions. Yep. So what do you do? I mean, you, I think you, you stay patient. You play underneath. Yeah. You give him late pre-snap looks, late in the down looks that he didn't see in his first diagnosis. Now he's better at that than he was before. Like. It, because again, the, the progression of Josh Allen this year was early in the season, heavy man blew it. You just blew it apart. There was that three game stretch where, what is this? You're spinning two to one and you're playing zone and you're playing quarter, quarter, half. And I don't know. And then he kind of got better at it, but he got better at it by throwing, you know, dink and dunk. So if it's me, I don't blitz. I stay patient. I, I yeah. do what the Colts did. And the Ravens yeah. can do that too. Martindale, whatever trends you have on Baltimore's defense, it's why Wink Martindale is so good. Whatever trends you think you have on Baltimore's defense, you really don't. No, I, I think that's right. I, I think Indianapolis did some things where they tried to take away his initial read, where they would show him mug looks, show him pressure looks, then drop and take away where his eyes went first. Um, there were a couple of times early in that game where, you know, they would show mug looks, one guy would come, they'd have – slid the protection the other way um, that they take away his hot read too. Um, but Indianapolis got away from that, like into the second half of the game. Um, yeah. They still stayed, you know, very patient, but they didn't show as much or as many mug looks as I would have liked. What's interesting about Baltimore is typically this year when they've done that, when they've shown mug up front, they've just come after you and said, look, we're just, we're going to put seven guys on the line of scrimmage in a two point stance and we're all coming. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious to see if that's part of the, you know, sort of script change that we see from Martindale, which is, yeah, I'll show you these pressure looks. I'll show you these mugged looks. I'll show you these exotic fronts. You expect me to come. We're going to drop seven. We're going to drop eight. And now we're going to make Josh Allen have to read and throw 
whereas he's not going to get, oh, I, I'm getting pressure here. I could just throw a nine route here to Stephon Diggs, or I can just throw this slant route underneath to Beasley because I know everybody's coming. Injuries played a part. Um, it, I'm looking at pro football reference. Ravens do have the highest blitz percentage of any team, 44.1%. Uh, they only got home to pressure 25.9% of the time, which is fifth behind the Steelers, Eagles, Bucks, Patriots. So <clears throat> you got Calais Campbell and Brandon Williams back. That helps. Um, I think they're, I mean, you go back to Marlon Humphrey in that Titans game, AJ Brown worked his ass. Yeah. And I'm not saying Humphrey's a bad player. I think he's one of the more underrated defensive backs in the league, but you know, there are gains to be made there. Yeah, there are. Um, you know, and I don't know where Diggs is going to be and who's going to be on him. If it's Diggs Peters, that's fascinating. You could wind up with a few of the issues you have potentially with Ramsey and uh, Adams, but yeah. yeah. Uh, remember that crazy stat from last, week, last week's podcast where Lamar Jackson has more touchdown passes against quarters than any other guy? Nine, I do. Based on what you've seen, why do you think that is? I mean, I think it's a really lot, surprising thing to me. I, I, I think a lot of it is probably just off the top of my head, he's probably seen it a ton. Um, because teams, I think back to early in the season when the Bengals played a lot of cover four against him, had some success with it, but you're playing it a lot because you want to keep eyes on him. Yeah. Um, you know, the problem is cover four uh, can turn it to cover zero pretty quickly, depending on how the play unfolds when you just get straight man coverage and you've got shot plays to take advantage of downfield. Um, well, you might on play action that's literally cover zero. Oops. Yeah, it's it literally, you know, sim pressures or play action against cover zero. Like, you know, if it doesn't get home, it's, I mean, <clears throat> against cover four, if it doesn't get home, it's, it's cover zero. Um, so I think Lamar's seen a lot of it. And I think a lot of the route concepts that they run the Baltimore Ravens, they have cover four beaters built in. A lot of bender vertical routes, a lot of post routes, a lot of stuff that, you know, if you get somebody to bite downhill and you've got corners playing outside leverage, thinking they've got help to the inside, um, and that help isn't there, it becomes a big play opportunity in the blink of an eye. And so I, I think that's part of it. Um, th this game's going to test our belief that Poyer and Hyde are the two best safeties in the NFL right now. Best safety. Um, because, I wouldn't say best safeties, but best safety duo. Best safety tandem, yeah, yeah. Because, look, when you play them, it, it, and I, I've talked about counter bash and stuff, Tennessee did a good job against that, but part of it was asking Bayard and Vicaro to come flying downhill and to be part of the run fit against it. That That's good and all, but when you ask safeties to start come flying downhill, it opens up that play action stuff. And so, Trinidad Edmonds and Matt Milano will have to be very disciplined, and I'll get into this why is, in a minute. Uh, this is a defensive discipline game from Buffalo's perspective. But just go, to go back to Lamar and quarters, Bills have played the third most cover four this season behind only the Browns and 49ers. 126 pass defense snaps, 90 completions for 862 yards, five touchdowns, one interception. Hmm. Yeah. So Buffalo's run defense, <laughs> 28th in DVOA in the first half of the season, 21st in the second half. They just don't have the loads up front. Ed Oliver, come on, dude. I compared you to John Randall in my draft report and you're making me look stupid. Bills have not been tested all that often against gap run games in which guards are pulling all over the place to mess up gap responsibilities. And here comes Baltimore who does that. I mean, the, the way they run, the way they pull their guards in gap in the second half of the season, especially in the last few weeks. I mean, yeah. it's very much like the San Francisco run game with Colin Kaepernick. Um, because it's they say playbook. Yeah. Well, Greg Roman, but it's not like that's all Roman's ever done. He's just sort of reverted, you know, reverted to good form in that regard. Um, so I'm looking at Milano and Edmonds who are both great players. I think Edmonds really has, uh, you know, top shelf potential. Your aggression, you're, you're going to want to be aggressive. Don't. Yeah. Well, so much of Baltimore's run game is structured to test your eye discipline because yes. when you've got, you know, whether it's counter bash with the guard and tackle pulling one way and running back going the other way, whether it's, you know, just QB power with, you know, the pullers and an opportunity for Lamar Jackson to pick his spots. Like this offense is designed to get linebackers out of position because of a lack of eye discipline. 
And that's you mentioned just, to, just to, uh, you mentioned last week a Cody Alexander piece on cross keying. Could you get into that? Because I think this might apply here. Right, and and what that is is when we talked about that counter bash design where you've got the guard and the tackle pulling say towards the right side of the offense, and the running back potentially running on an outside run to the left, so opposite from the pullers. Um, what high school and college teams have started to do is what we call cross keying. So you've got two linebackers across from the quarterback and the running back the linebacker across from the quarterback, we always expect him to be reading the quarterback. Well, he's actually reading the guy next to him. He's reading the running back and vice versa. So you're reading the back across from you and you're keying what they do. And if, if they move away from you, then that's what you do. You'll flow with that and vice versa. Um, so it's because, you know, when you start getting guys separating like that and not working on a string, like you sometimes hear defensive coordinators talk about, that's when you give up those big plays. And so teams have used this sort of cross key design to slow down, you know, schemes like counter bash. Tennessee did some of that. Like I did a video um, for one of our preview pieces where showing how Tennessee stopped counter bash and cross key and was part of it. You know, they had linebacks that were clearly reacting to the guy opposite from them, not the guy across from them. And the thing is, if you, I mean, the Browns do some of it because they have Wyatt Teller, who's the best pulling guard in the NFL. But if you haven't played the Ravens and maybe the Browns, I mean, who else does this? It, it's not like you're going to get a bunch of, you know, reps against this with other teams. Oh, I mean, the, the Eagles the did do some, a little bit, don't they? Yeah, I mean, the Titans do a little bit of it. The Eagles did some of it, but in, in the, late in the season with Hurts, um, yeah. other offenses that have used it. There's really not many. I mean, Baltimore's run structure is very unique because of the unique talent that Lamar Jackson is. Um, you know, it's kind of like playing Vic, the the Vic Falcons, uh, 04 through 06, where they led the league in rushing every year. Yeah. Um, where, okay, where else do I get this Alex Gibbs plan? There is nowhere else. Right. Yeah. I uh, mean, that to me is, a, is it's, it's a matter where, you know, the Bills have played the Patriots twice this year, obviously. The the Patriots run game with Cam. The Patriots did they didn't do run anything nah. like this. No. I mean, their 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 run game structure with Cam Newton was more veer and your typical standard zone read type stuff. It wasn't, you know, this bash stuff, this back away stuff and the other elements of the done, you know, QB power with multiple pullers. You know, they, they did a smattering of that compared to what the Ravens did. Yep. I uh, also like to apologize. One of my chickens has decided to freak out outside. Oh, this, so there you go. Happens. Free chicken noise. Uh, yeah. So your piece on the Ravens making Josh Allen question what he sees. Please elaborate. Yeah. And that, that was some of what I've talked about. Um, when I saw um, Indianapolis early showing those mug looks and then dropping, you know, on one play, they had the mug looks, both linebackers walked up front in the A and B yaps. Um, he thought he was going to get a quick, easy curl route to the right, but they dropped and the dropping linebacker took it away. And then he had to sort of re, you know, calibrate his eyes and his thinking, but then the pressure was getting home. Um, so that sent me back through this season to see other examples of teams doing stuff like that against him. I pulled some plays together, like games against the Steelers, um, a couple of other teams where, you know, they would show him these pressure looks and then drop, or they would do different things up front where he was expected something pre-snap and then didn't get a post snap. Another one was, you know, you mentioned that stretch of games mid season, Kansas city, Tennessee, new England, the first time teams that he struggled against, particularly against zone coverage. One of them was a play where, you know, Bayard almost intercepted him because it was an overload look to the right. He thought, you know, he was going to get this. And then they all dropped and Bayard was an underneath hole defender and, you know, jumped on a route that could have been an interception. And so, that's, you know, not a lot of things are working against Josh Allen right now, but when you're trying to like thread the needle of what will slow him down, this is something that might. And yes, that was a olive branch to all the people on YouTube that have been yelling at me for the past 48 hours that Josh Allen is going to carve up the Ravens and I'm an idiot. I am an idiot. I know that, but this is something that has worked a couple of times this year with teams showing Josh Allen one look, making him think this is what he's going to get and then spinning it into something completely different, taking away where he wants to go immediately with the football right after the snap. I was, was it why, oh, you are an idiot? I hope. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's see. Bills need to stay at home around the alleys against Lamar. You wrote on that. 
Uh, Ravens play a ton of two man, which Josh Allen would find beneficial in a hypothetical sense. Maybe not this week. Like I said, one of the things I like about Martindale, I, 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 you know, <laughs> not my first rodeo. You think, oh, they're going to do this, and they completely switch it up. He's really good in a Belichickian sense of kind of flipping the script from week to week. He will play to his opponent as opposed to yeah. this is what I do, and you know, to hell with it. Yeah, I think the days of this is what I do are over. <laughs> Fascinating matchup. Uh, Browns at Chiefs. I want to start here. Patrick Mahomes from weeks one through 13. 316 completions and 463 attempts for 3,815 yards. 8.2 yards per attempt, 31 touchdowns, two interceptions, 15 sacks, 22 drops, and a pass rating of 113.8. Patrick Mahomes from weeks 14 through 17. 74 completions and 125 attempts for 925 yards. 7.4 7.4 yards per attempt, seven touchdowns, four interceptions, seven sacks, 10 drops, passer rating of 87.6. So in the last month of the season, and he's had a week off, uh, 113.8 to 87.6. The difference, pressure. Weeks one through 13, he had 167 dropbacks under pressure. Weeks uh, 14 through 17, he had 55. Uh, now the Browns rank 24th in pressure rate, 20, 21.0%. They're at 29th in blitz rate, 21.3. And if you blitz Mahomes, you're going to die. I'm not sure what choice the Browns have, especially when you look at their safeties, which we'll get into. But that's something to note, that over the last month, it's not like it's been disastrous in a Russell Wilson sense, like what the hell's going on? And they have had a week to sort of rest Mahomes, and, you know, but Assembly's out. Uh, I don't know what Mitchell Schwartz's status is, but for a, a right-handed offense – Mitchell Schwartz is the best pass protecting right tackle in the NFL. They haven't had him since like what week six. So yeah, if against a more stout pressure defense, I would say this would be something to really worry about. I don't know how the Browns and you studied, I mean, you did the AFC pieces the last two weeks. So you studied this more intricately than I have, but if you're the Browns, how do you generate pressure without, because Mahomes against the blitz this year, uh, he was like, yeah, higher passer rating, 116.5 when facing five or more pass rushers than he has against four fewer pass rushers, 109.0, 64 touchdowns and 16 picks in his career against four fewer pass rushers, 23 touchdowns and one interception in his career against five or more. So you can't blitz him. You're not great at generating pressure without the blitz. You have a guy who is starting, the pressure is starting to compound his performance. What do you do? I mean, A, I hope you think Miles Garrett eats his Wheaties before yeah. the game. And, and, you know, if you get a game where Miles Garrett just goes off now, look, he's been hampered by injuries. Early in the year, Miles Garrett was an MVP candidate in my mind. Yeah. Then he had the ankle injury, the knee injury, the COVID bout that he says he's still sort of recovering from. You know, but if he can channel the early season Miles Garrett where he sacked Dak Prescott, I think, three times in the first half, you could get some of that pressure. If you get at least the presence of Miles Garrett – forcing Kansas City to slide protection his way and you do some creative stunts and twists away from Garrett and you catch Kansas City that's another way to do it uh because you Olivier can't Vernon, him. by the way uh let's see torn Achilles tendon January it would help if Vernon was there on the other side yeah but um, you're not going to get that that you're not going to get that no um because like you said you don't want to blitz it but you do want to pressure because PFF has adjusted completion percentage on Mahomes of 64.9%, which is middle of the pack, 16th in the league, behind illustrious names this season as Gardner Minshew, Nick Mullins, Derek Carr, and Cam Newton. Did like, I that's not have, good company. Did, did you just throw Gardner Minshew slander? I didn't throw Gardner Minshew. Head? I'm just saying. I'm just saying, Doug. I'm, I'm going to have to edit that part out. Okay. okay, edit it out. I'll, I'll you can you can leave him when I say Sam Darnold. How yeah. about that? So, um, but so yeah, pressure has worked as far as working against Kansas City and Patrick Mahomes goes this season. The problem is, what do you do? What are you doing behind that? Because <laughs> Cleveland safeties are a disaster waiting to happen in this game. And I want to say this: it's not like any of these guys. Uh, Andrew Sandejo, Sheldrick Redwine, Carl Joseph, and Ronnie Harrison. I'm not, they lost Del Pitt to injury and they never replaced him. I mean, they wanted to solve the safety issue with Del Pitt, who I believe would have done that. None of these guys are 
deep third safeties. No, they're, they're all, all, they're they're all, all strong safeties. Backers. Yeah. I mean, you can't you know, ask one all, of these guys like, to play too moving, high or single high. Like you can chancellors without, you know, being cam chancellor so that's what they are yeah and it, it, it this sets up where you know what kansas city can do in the vertical passing game and you know the limitations of this browns back third of their defense in terms of asking box safeties to play devin mccourty roles they they can't do it and so the safeties have allowed 14 touchdowns and coverage this year with four interceptions yeah that's not good and yeah you know ben Ben's dead arm, uh, it doesn't matter. Now it matters. Yeah. Um, and you, so know, you, the thing, in, you did something on the Belichick plan against Mahomes. Yeah. And, and I don't know. You know I, I mean, I don't know. It, it's, it's tough to replicate because the Belichick plan, it's one of those high school clinics where it's like, yeah, we're plus one to the field, plus one to the boundary. We're plus two in the secondary. We're getting pressure with three. And my two safeties are five-star athletes going to LSU and Alabama next year. Like, Cleveland doesn't have that, you know, Belichick does. He has Devin McCourty, who even at this point in his career is one of the best safeties in the NFL still. And you have JC Jackson and you have Stephon Gilmore. And so when you run one, one cross or, you know, one double 10 or whatever you do, and you're trying to like switch off crossing routes mid play, like the Patriots have done with some great success against Patrick Mahomes, even though they didn't win this year, it's tougher to do with these guys, you know, it, when you're asking guys like Sendejo and Redwine to like nail down on a crosser against Tyree Kill in the blink of an eye, that's a tough ask. Like the game plan, they could install it and maybe they could execute it on a couple of plays. But then this gets into the idea that you mentioned earlier of, oh, you know, keeping a good quarterback on the sideline as a spectator because you want to work the clock against him. Well, well, we've seen what you, you know, you can get up 21 on Mahomes, and, and he's going to score 28 in the next four minutes. Yep. So they only need one play against these safeties to tie the game in the blink of an eye. I wish we could have Buccaneers cornerback Carlton Davis on our podcast right now, because when the Buccaneers and Chiefs played earlier this season, Todd right. Bowles for, and we'll get into the two Todd Bowles defenses, <laughs> the yeah. one really good and the one really bad. Um, they put poor Carlton Davis, who was a good cornerback. They put Carlton Davis on Tyree Kill. Hill scored three touchdowns in that game. And all of them, they had Carlton Davis trailing Tyree Kill without safety help. And I think on, on one of those plays, Antoine Winfield Jr. was supposed to go over and he didn't. But they had a, a design where you your cornerback is trailing Tyree Kill without safety help. Now, that's something you never want to do. The Browns, even if they put a safety to that side, may not have. It might be the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know how the Browns win this game. I mean, I can talk about Wyatt Teller's on-off stats and you know Hunt and and Chubb, Baker out of empty, great Baker boot action to his left, great. Here's how they win this game. Fourteen points out of that. Cause, cause we said that last week too. I don't know how the Browns so, win this game. Yeah, so what you're going to get, Boston. yeah. Bot snap three interceptions. One of them's like a deep return and a 28, nothing lead. And even then that might not be enough. Just ask Bill O'Brien. Now the offensive coordinator at Alabama, what an early lead against Mahomes gets you. Yeah. Bupkis. Yeah. How do, how do the Browns win? Seriously. Like <laughs> beyond whatever the hell happened last week. I mean, the, the thing to remember about Kansas City is this. Since they blew out the Jets back in week eight, I think 38 to nine, every win this year down the stretch was a one point win. Now, I mean, a one score win. Now, you had, look, you had a Tampa Bay victory, but that was before Tampa Bay's bye week when they became a much different offense after that. Much. We'll and we'll get into that in a minute. Yeah. One of those one score wins was against another playoff team, the New Orleans Saints but that was Brees' first game back, and he has been a much different quarterback since coming back from those rib fractures. But you're also talking about one-score games against Carolina, Denver, the Atlanta Falcons in Week 16, like teams that did not make the playoffs and some of whom are working for a new head coach and general manager now. Um, in some of those games, you know, I watched that Atlanta game. I watched that Carolina game. They did some of the stuff with coverage switches in the middle of the field. Um, there were a couple of moments where Carolina, which we talked about, excoriated them early in the season, being just a spot drop cover three team. 
they started doing more stuff with low hole and high hole robbers where you've got guys taking away those crossing routes in the middle of the field. Um, similar to what I just was talking about with Belichick. Now they still hit for some big plays on those, but they also, the Panthers did had some opportunities to make some turnovers in the middle of the field. And the guys at PFF will tell you that for all we want to say about Mahomes and, you know, his interception numbers might be low. The interceptable pass rate is mm -hmm. a bit higher. Oh, he's, he's lived a charm. Going back to, I watched tape with him and before he was drafted, we, we went over the Texas game where he was just throwing deep balls out with no thought of it. And Texas dropped like eight interceptions. So he's, he's yeah. been charmed throughout his entire career with that. There are plays to be made. Can Cleveland make them? Like, that's the big question I have. Browns fans, I was I, I had to go deep into the Football Outsiders uh, subscriber rabbit hole. I'm going to give Browns fans a little bit of hope. Cleveland's passing offense, weeks one through nine, 16th in DVOA. Weeks 10 through 17, seventh. Kansas City's pass defense. Check this out. Switch over here. Kansas City's pass defense, sixth, weeks one through nine, 29th, weeks 10 through 17. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. I mean, maybe they can make it close and then, you know, something weird happens. Maybe yeah. this is, maybe this is the Browns karma season for everything that's happened before. We'll see. Maybe. I mean, look, it might be, I just half time of that Steelers game Sunday night, Jeff Raisin, who we both know and love yep. who covers the Browns for Browns wire. Um, Fellow somebody, had, somebody had mentioned that the halftime line was Pittsburgh plus 19 of that game. And they were thinking about putting some money on it. And Jeff said, Pittsburgh might win by 19. And this was at halftime. Oh, yeah. Like Browns fans are still very skeptical, but maybe this is a karma season for them. Yeah. We'll see. Buccaneers at Saints. Tom Brady against the Saints this season in week one and nine. 45 of 74 for 448 yards, 60.8 completion rate, 6.1 yards per attempt, two touchdowns, five interceptions, and a passer rating of 58.8. Week one. Brady's first game in, uh, the Saints were reading the quick outs all the way. Janoris Jenkins had a pick six. Lattimore and Jenkins said after the game, um, you know, we, we knew this was coming because they, they did it last year. So that was Arian sort of forcing his offense onto Brady. Week nine, I know we, we discussed this at length on the podcast. That was the absolute nadir of the Brady Arians marriage. That's when I'm like, I don't think this is going to work. Yeah. Brady was way off on deep shots with all his receivers. I mean, Scotty Miller um godwin antonio brown each like it wasn't a miscommunication where the receiver runs a dig and brady thinks it's an out this was like the receiver was off by 15 yards on three different plays i've never seen that three times in a game this is now a very different and far more integrated offense more 12 yeah. personnel more play action more pre-snap motion they're finally giving Brady the things he needs to succeed consistently because i'm gonna say it again uh, this should be a uh, we need to get t-shirts. Don't play man. If you can't play man and every quarterback is a system quarterback. Yep. So the saints are not facing the same Brady and they're not facing the same offense. They faced this season. And that's where it gets, because the saints play a ton of man coverage and they're not that bad in coverage when they do it, but Brady against man, this season, 128 completions and 211 attempts for 1,591 yards, 1,019 air yards, 17 touchdowns, three interceptions, and a total QBR of 119.4. Most notably, Brady threw five picks against the Saints this year, four were in zone, against zone. Yep. So I, what saw, I'm, I saw you yeah, just outline I, that on the, on the Google Doc because that's, that's kind of remarkable. I'm just very fascinated to see if the Saints, how much man they're going to play in this game. Um, not just because of the numbers, because of the change in this – Buccaneers offense down the stretch because you know John Ledyard who covers the the box for Pewter Report he sent me a DM like uh maybe a month or month and a half ago it was after their bye week and it was a clip of a plan he's like are they running mesh mm -hmm. did Bruce Arians just call mesh Pew. yeah they've they've started running mesh now and what's what was fascinating was in a video that I did that's actually probably dropping on the timeline in five minutes uh, for my palace over at the scouting academy um the evolution of how they've run mesh has been interesting because that first example it was against atlanta the first time they played them uh -huh. they were the guys on the crosses were like hesitant they were afraid of like colliding with people so it was like an awkward example they of the, it they didn't do the low five they didn't do the mike leach low five no doug um 
But by the playoffs, when they ran it on a third down conversion against Washington, it was like textbook. Yeah, anytime you say it, you got to do the Mora. Um, It was like textbook. And what's even better about the way they're doing it, in typical Bruce Arians fashion, I saw an example of them run mesh, running back wheel, and a two-man flood concept on the backside, which is just – that's just Bruce Arians, right? A flood concept with a man beater. He's just incorporated now the man beater is mesh. Wheel post, mesh wheel post all season. I, I yeah. don't see enough of it. So Bruce, I love you. Yeah, and, and I want so Bruce, I want Bruce Arians to be my dad. He's so cool. Seriously, I, I I will tell a quick story. I was doing it on the iPhone the other night at dinner. One of those things that the iPhone does, where you can like they'll like curate a little video and set it to music of your photographs. And I did one of like memories from the past year, and it started showing these combine pictures. And there are a bunch of pictures of Arians at the podium at the combine. He's, Warmed my heart. He's gonna so miss awesome. it this year. Um, but no, the, the, the man coverage stuff that they're starting to do, the mesh concepts, the, they're a horizontal offense, but it's still a Bruce Arians vertical system at times too. Um, it's a, it's a completely different offense. So I, if you're Dennis Allen, the thing about Bruce is everyone thinks vert, 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 his offense is it's, it's three digit and it's very much based on, I was talking to Greg Cosell about this years ago. And Greg told me Bruce's offense is based a lot on old school Sid Gilman principles, which is you run levels to the front, you get the easy crosser on the back. The backside ISO is your is your is your hot. Yeah. your hot. And then it's levels to the front. So it's not just it's not just four verts and a you know, whatever. He's it's a very evolved passing game. It's just that he, you know, Bruce was saying one, uh, like a month and a half ago, well, Peyton Manning never needed pre-snap motion. So why the hell should I do it? It's going to confuse linemen. And then, you know, I, I guess it was like one of those Brady Belichick. I always think of Brady Belichick at the desk where they're talking about Ed Reed. Ed Reed, yeah. And um, yeah, he's just all right. Um, rumble, rumble, rumble. That was the best idea. Um, I could see Brady and Arians and and Brady just saying, you know, let's try these three things. And one, I think was heavier personnel, Gronk and Bray, both in the game. Hello. Um, And then those cross switch release mesh, whatever Um, run, run flood to the front, all those things, but that's a fully integrated passing game. Saints have not seen that. So that's, that's a different thing for them. Um, Marshawn Lattimore, I, I have to apologize to Marshawn Lattimore a little bit. He has been better in the second half of the season, but you know, if we're, if we're doing a who's your Huckleberry thing, um, I'm targeting Lattimore a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and especially like when you start thinking about some of these concepts we've talked about, when you've got crossers or you, you run inverts out of heavy, you can isolate him. You know, and, and they've used him at times as the post safety. You bracket him with some of those vertical concepts. Yeah, you're going to have success. So even when you factor in the improvement in the second half of the season, Brady has completed 62, 141 passes under pressure this season, four touchdowns, five picks, passer rating of 56.8. Your passer rating under pressure is worse than that of Ben Roethlisberger, Kyler Murray, and Andy Dalton. Mark, I'm going to go ahead and say that's not ideal. It's not ideal. I do think, though, Dalton was very good against pressure this year. Yeah, he was. I mean, I, I do want to give him some credit. I mean, his adjusted completion percentage under pressure of 76.7 was second best in the league. And Dalton was 13th overall uh, with an NFL pass rate of 74.4. So, I mean, you got to so stick up for Andy Dalton here. Positive on Minshew and a positive on Dalton. I may have to shut this thing down. Um, Seriously, we're, we're, we're spitting the coverages today, Doug. Yikes, late in the down. This season, okay, we're talking about Brady's kryptonite. This is a problem. This is a problem, yeah. yeah. Saints ranked third in the league in total pressures behind the Steelers and Bucks with 298. That's also a problem for Breeze, and we'll get into that in a minute. Per Sports Info Solutions, they also have nine sacks, 46 quarterback hits, 58 quarterback hurries, 21 knockdowns, and 80 total pressures from the defensive tackles. Now, when we say defensive tackles, that means the inside guys. It doesn't mean I, – I don't have numbers for Cam Jordan coming in on a stunt versus beating the tackle on the edge. But as has been the case throughout his career, interior pressure is Brady's kryptonite. So this is something to watch. Bucks have a healthy Ellie Marpet, best garden football, end of story. 
Brian Jensen at center, right guard Alex Kappa. We don't talk about him a lot. Um, he looks like a Viking. He was like, like one of those Swedish death metal bands. Uh, out for the rest of the postseason with a fractured ankle. Kappa hasn't allowed a single sack all season. He's replaced by Aaron Stinney, a third-year undrafted free agent who has 46 career regular season snaps. Hmm. That's a recipe for disaster, I think. Well, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know about disaster, but like if they have to move Jensen over to tackle – that's when that – that's uh, – I think it was the Saints – I think it was oh, the Week 9 game. Yeah. The Panthers. They moved Jensen over to left guard when Marpet had concussion issues, and that that's when the interior got really shaky. They need they need Jensen in the middle. So, you know, Bruce has said, all the, you know, Stinney's really athletic and whatever. He's like, well, okay, sure, I guess. I mean, I don't have tape on him. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I just, I just think, you know – when you combine Brady's pressure numbers with the ability to get interior pressure on him, when you've got Stinney in and try to pull up some of his, you know, pass block at reps right now on game pass. And there's not a lot to look at, but from what I'm seeing early, it doesn't look great. This could be a situation where you see a lot of Jordan stunted into his gap yep. and really sort of testing him from a mental process and a situation as well as that athleticism that Aaron likes to talk about. Because if you get that A-gap pressure on Brady, you're going to get some of those bad pressure numbers. This could be a problem for Tampa Bay. I think it will be a problem for Tampa Bay. I don't know. Um, oh my God, I don't know what his status is, but the Saints from there, yeah, Sheldon Rankins, I mean, they've got a ton of pressures, yeah, from just their DTs. And then you factor in, um, I don't know what Trey Hendrickson's status is. I think he might be out. But yeah, this this could be an issue. Hendrickson, looking this up right now, won't play in the wild card round. Had a neck injury. We'll see. It would help if they could have him on the other side of the, of that. So let's switch to the Saints' offense. Highly dependent on the quick game. In those two Bucks games, Breeze was pressured on just twenty of his sixty-five dropbacks, sacked twice. Also completed nine of 17 passes for 79 yards, two touchdowns, no picks, and a passer rating of 104.8 under pressure. Uh, Saints quick game is the key to all of it. He's averaged, Breeze has averaged 2.7 seconds per attempt from snap to throw the season, eighth quickest among quarterbacks with at least 50% of their team snaps. Breeze also has 18 touchdowns and one interception on throws. He gets off in less than 2.5 seconds per PFF, as opposed to eight touchdowns and five interceptions on throws that take more than 2.5 seconds. So what you want to do with Breeze is force him to extend the play. Yeah. And then he has to use his arm on sort of those scramble rule routes. And maybe that's not. <clears throat> and the interesting thing about, and we'll, we'll talk, I mean, I can summarize it. I've been talking about all year. The Todd Bowles good defense is multiple fronts tied to aggressive coverage, and it's brilliant. And then you take Levante David and Devin White, best linebacker due in the NFL by far, and you put them all over the formation to create pressure, especially Devin White. Um, against Saints in two games, I, I, I looked this up and I couldn't believe it. White allowed 15 catches on 17 targets for 108 yards, 65 yards after the catch, two touchdowns, no interceptions. He had no quarterback pressures of any kind in either game. Yeah. No sacks, no quarterback hits, no quarterback hurries. Bupkis. He has the most sacks and the second most pressures of any off-ball linebacker in the NFL this season, and he's really bad in coverage. But this is a guy who he had three – he had two three-set games this year, uh, once against the Raiders, once against the Falcons. And you know how ever since Jadavion Clowney got drafted, everyone talked about him. He's going to three teams now. Houston, Seattle, Tennessee. Everyone talked about him as he's going to be the spinner, the spinner. And he's going to get pressure from every gap. Devin White is actually doing that. You can line him up anywhere from, I mean, because he will, who was I talking to? It wasn't DM Buchanan. It was one of those hybrid linebacker guys like five years ago. And I, I mentioned to this kid who was getting pressure from all different gaps i said you read gaps like a running back and he said yeah that's absolutely the point that's what you're supposed to do when you're blitzing from the second level white reads gaps like a running back and that makes him dangerous they've had bare fronts where they put david and white on the edge as the outside linebackers the the end backers the pass rushers so if i'm todd bowles um let's stop with the static front and the spot drop crap because that's not going to work. Um, I know 
and White has missed the last two games with COVID issues. He's back now, and he was saying, you know, we have Jason Pierre-Paul, we have Shaq Barrett. Maybe I'm going to go into coverage and beat people up. I'm like, no, 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 no. You are the third pass rusher in every package as yeah. far as I'm concerned. We do not want you covering. If you are doing anything else but rushing the passer, we are making a big mistake. Because yeah. it's not – I'm not saying that because he's bad in coverage. I'm saying that because he is the – like, if you're a defensive coordinator, you dream of this guy. You waste bad early draft picks on guys you think can get pressure from every gap. The Buccaneers have one. They've got one right there. He's proven it all season. I wrote at length about this on Touchdown Wire. Devin White can get pressure from every gap. There may be – as an off-ball linebacker, I mean, Demario Davis can do it. A couple other guys can do it. Bobby Wagner can do it. It's exceedingly rare. And he's got the speed. There was one sack he had against Derek Carr where he flipped back like 15 yards in coverage on a Tampa 2 look, and Carr started to roll to his right. And Devin White came down crashing like he was Earl Thomas in Earl Thomas's prime and got him to the sideline. So if I'm Todd Bowles, Devin White is my spinner. He's my he's my interior pressure guy. He's the joker, the guy you can't really account for. And he becomes a problem for a Saints offensive line that's very good. But, you know, I think you're facing that Saints offensive line. You want to get out the schneid against them. You had better start messing with their protections. And for whatever reason, Bowles didn't do it in either game against the Saints. Yeah, and I, I think that's part of why, you know, that makes a ton of sense because when you start thinking about what you want to do against Breeze, you want to force him to throw late and down, like you said. You want to force him to hold on to the football. You don't want to give him the quick game, you know, because well, – And that, you, you mentioned the quick game, and two of the sacks against the Falcons um, it were, were three-step drops. And he uh, – it was like a delayed blitz. I don't want to say that. But two of those sacks were against three-step drops. So he's that fast. Yeah. I mean, because you want Breeze to have to try to push the ball downfield late in the down. You want Breeze to try to test throwing windows downfield late in the down because the arm isn't where it needs to be because of the injuries, I think. And when you start thinking about what we've seen from this Tampa Bay defense this year, I think back to that Green Bay game where they were exotic up front. They showed different looks. They were confusing. You know, and they probably weren't confusing Aaron Rodgers in terms of who was coming or who wasn't, but the guys around him. You know, th that's what you do on defense because you don't always have to try to confuse the QB. Well, you can confuse Aaron Rodgers because the Panthers did it. Right. Um, <laughs> but you don't – it is possible. Uh, but you don't have to try to – you know, if you could confuse Drew Brees, great. But if you could confuse, you know, Taron Armstead or Ryan Ramshack, that's just as good too um, because you might get a free rusher at Drew Brees and force him off the spot, force him to pull the ball down, not give him that quick throw, and then you've got a chance to stop this offense. I want to read a quote, um, one of the all 22 pieces, one of the 22 all 22 pieces we've done in the last two weeks. <laughs> uh, nice. Brandon Staley, Rams defensive coordinator, said this on December 23rd, a few days before he had the challenge of defending Russell Wilson for the second time. Um, he said, I think pass defense is pass rushing and pass coverage working together. I think you hear that sometimes in the NFL, whether you're in three, four, five, six, seven man rush, whatever type of coverage you play, whether it's zone or man pattern match, it has to fit together against Russell Wilson because there's no look that's going to surprise him. He's seen it all. What you have to deal with in Russell is his legs and his escape ability, which is widely documented. But you also have to deal with the processor in his brain. This guy is as sharp as it gets. And if you make mistakes, he's going to capitalize. You have to have your front and your coverage working together. I'm going to read that again because this is where defense is going. You have to have your front and your coverage working together. The alignment of multiple fronts and aggressive coverage is next level NFL. And the, I think over the next two or three seasons, the teams that do this and the teams that don't, the, the gap in quality is going to be astonishing. Staley goes on to say, because if there's a mistake in either of those places, he's going to find it. It takes a full 11 man operation. You have heard me talk about 22 guys in the game because you have to chase this guy around for four quarters or overtime. It takes a team effort to get it done. And that I, I read that quote and pasted it into my article. And I thought, boy, that's just, well, that's, that's why he came in and replaced a future hall of fame coach and assembled the top scoring defense in the NFL. Cause he gets where the NFL is going. 
a reading from the Gospel of Belichick from a couple of years ago. If you have the receivers covered, it gives the pass rush more opportunity. If you don't have the receivers covered, then even a good rush isn't going to result in a quarterback getting tackled. The interceptions are a result of pass rush, just like the sacks are a result of coverage. It's really team defense. There you go. There you go. From the These guys know what they're talking about. Yep. Bill 316. Okay, those are the four matchups. Any other, st- any other uh, thoughts there, Dr. Schofield? Uh, Charlie Strawn as a potential offensive coordinator under Urban Meyer, apparently. Mm. What do you think of that? That's a hire. That's a <laughs> That was <laughs> – yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, um, I just I, – I don't know. Uh, knowing you as I do, uh, that was – because you're just such a nice guy. Um, I try to be. Yeah. I, I just, I don't know. I, 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 I was cautiously optimistic on Urban Meyer when this began, this show began. I'm now slotted over to your camp where I just don't know in the course of an hour. I mean, I don't have anything against Urban Meyer. I just, I look back to coaches who have succeeded in, in their college to NFL transitions and coaches who haven't. And I don't know if he's got any of the starter pack. I just don't know. Yeah. No. I read that already. Potential defensive coordinator. It doesn't matter. Whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, great stuff as always, man. Uh, we'll have this up in a few. Pop it over to Touchdown Wire for all our all 22 pieces, 22 all 22s. And uh, yeah, enjoy the the, the, the awesomest, the most awesomest week of the uh, NFL season divisional round. And Mark, we'll talk next week. Sounds good, my friend.